Okay, good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Chatty Cathy's. Bunch of Chatty Cathy's around here. And Chatty Charlie's, I guess. We want to keep it. Are you identifying as Chatty Cathy or Chatty Charlie tonight? I <laughs> you what? Okay, very good. Uh-uh. Good to see you guys tonight. What a lovely, lovely Oregon day today, huh? My goodness, yes, sir. I thought it was just about perfect. So, anyway, good to be with you. You know, Sunday I really, really dropped the ball. I had so much on my mind and so much going on, and I just really forgot to um, thank all the folks that helped us over there at the school on Saturday. And, you know, if you're here and you did help us over there, I want to let you know how much I appreciate that. And it really means a lot to me to see people pitch in and not put all the work on just a couple people which is what usually happens, but, you know, we're an exception to the rule most of the time, so what can you say, right? But uh, I think that that event for us was probably the most successful we've had all these years. And uh, Glenn did a great job um, sharing when he had an opportunity to share with them over the mic, and I thought that was really good, and The kids were a lot of kids, and so it was exactly what we were trying to do. And uh, you folks that were in the booth, a church booth, I was impressed because last year, some of the people that had sat in there, that's what they did. They sat in there in the back and watched people walk by, and you say, hi, I got to get up there and engage people. Yeah, and that, that was going on too, so I was just absolutely blessed and uh, looking forward to doing more. One thing you can be praying about is um, I got um, a notice from Five Rock saying we're not going to be able to go up there this summer. Um, They got some stuff going on. So I'm looking for suggestions for a place that's a park with some water where we can do baptizing. And if any of you know of a place, if you want to let me know about that, that would be awesome. Um, I went over to Milk... Uh, uh, I was thinking a little thing that might be a little easier to get to, maybe. 90 people or something like that. So, any we can talk about it. We'll talk about it. I'm just putting a bug in your ear, and you can uh, let me know as next week or two go by. All right, so we're going to continue our um, study in First Kings tonight, and um, uh, quick review, I guess. We, as we went through these last couple chapters, we, uh, we saw that the temple got finished, we saw everything got moved into the temple, and then uh, we saw, read about all of the stuff that Solomon had, all of the excess, if you will. Uh, that he, he had no one man needs all that but uh, I guess when you're Solomon you do so what's going to happen tonight um, is not good news and this this is uh, this is what you might call turning the page in Solomon's life and in the nation of Israel um, it's a downhill spiral from here so a lot of heartbreak and uh, you know these people they did they did the exact same thing that people do today you know people they're on fire for a while and they start looking around and they start seeing other things to worship and they go after it and they're starting gathering things and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's in the world that will naturally draw our hearts away from our spiritual relationship with God. It's really, really hard to have a lot of stuff and keep everything in perspective. 
it's really, really easy to lose sight um, of our main purpose on this planet. And that is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to share the good news with others that there is hope and that there is salvation. Um, but we can get so caught up in things that it, you know, I'm, I, I know even from experience that it can interfere, it can quench, it can cool down that, that fire that we once had for the Lord. So is there something wrong with having stuff? No, not in and of itself. But what it does to our relationship with, with God, that's the main issue here. And uh, so let's, let's go ahead and start reading down through here. Chapter 11. We have to pray, though, before we study. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come together tonight. To open your word, to study it, Lord, to, to watch this sad story begin. Lord, I just pray that we would learn from this um, as we continue through our study in these books, that we will see this uh, repeating itself over and over again. And we also realize, God, at the same time, that we are no different than these people. We have the same tendencies and the same weaknesses. But one thing we have that they didn't have, and we have you, Holy Spirit. We have your spirit living in us, Lord. And I believe that that gives us the capability and the strength that we can keep our eyes upon you and not allow these things to drag us away from you or to quench your spirit in our lives. Help us to keep our priorities straight too, God. Speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites. From the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn Away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. So there's a couple things here that we want to touch on before we go any further here. Every single one of these group people groups um, were idol worshipers. They worshiped different kinds of idols, which we'll take a look at a few of them as we go down through here. Um, but, you know, God warns us about how we behave and the consequences of our behavior. And if you look at what's going on here with Solomon, the Lord told him, they will turn your heart away after their God. And then it says, Solomon clung to them. He clings to these women. He's clinging to this culture that the creator of the universe has been warning them about all along. In verse 3, it tells us that he had three or 700 wives and princesses. And he had 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. A thousand women in your life well, you would think so, but I got a sense that people during that time would collect women and they would house them and they would give someone to care for them and bathe them and pamper them and feed them and do everything they need to do to keep them beautiful in the hopes that maybe some night he would call upon them. But there were a lot of these women that never got called upon. They died waiting um, for the king. He did, He and he hardly ever used um, the majority of them. So, I mean, and then to have 300 concubines, I mean, this is uh, insanity. Uh, overkill is not the word for it. I, I don't know what you would call I think insanity works pretty darn good. Um, but the sad part about this is that, you know, God had warned them about this. David was guilty. 
you know, I mean, like father, like son. Um, David wasn't a very good parent. He didn't set a very good example for his kids. And many times we see how David failed in his fathering uh, role. So it's not a surprise that Solomon has all these riches. He has um, all this power. And he feels as though he needs to collect all of these women, which is a sign of authority and power in that culture. Harem is a word that we're familiar with. Um, one of the groups of people that we mentioned up in verse 1 was the Hittites. These people were probably some of the most ruthless people in the whole region there. They have recently... Um, they have recently discovered Hittite um, ruins. For a long, long time, people believed that a lot of these people groups were just kind of made up, um, that they never really existed. But now, with excavation and science and all the ways we have to, to do things with the technology we have, they've actually uncovered a Hittite um, city. These people were absolutely ruthless. What they did to their enemies was unspeakable. Um, a lot of them they did not kill. They would maim them in a horrible, horrible way. Um, they impaled human beings. They, they did horrible things. Um, something you could point to to maybe kind of get an idea, I would say the way ISIS behaved when they were in power. They did things like that. They would behead men and put their heads on poles and put them at the edge of these towns and they would impale people and they would rape and murder the women and the children. And uh, the Hittites were a lot like that. Very, very evil, evil people. For so it was, verse 4, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, and was the, as was the heart of his father David. And again, we know that David wasn't always on track. David did some bad things. But I don't think that we ever read anywhere where David actually walked away from Jehovah to worship a different god, a false god. Um, Solomon's old now. Now, how, many, how long have we been dealing with Solomon? Well, a few chapters. Most of those chapters have been about his exploits and building and engineering and um, all those wonderful things and the, the great you know, musicians that he had and all these things that he's... he's well, within a few chapters... His life is done. When we did uh, the last two books, um, you might remember First and Second Samuel, that was pretty much all about David. Whereas you look at what the Bible gives us concerning Solomon, it's just a little, like a little mention almost compared. Um, so some time has gone by. And during the time that's been going by, and this is the thing we want to be able to see here, as time went by, his heart was pulled away from his God. His heart was pulled away from Jehovah. And um, it went after the, uh, the gods in the uh, regions in which these people lived. And again, you know, over in Deuteronomy, he, he warns these people, in Deuteronomy, he said, do not make a treaty with them. Don't become allies with them. Don't give your daughters to their sons. Or take their daughters for your sons. So sometimes these marriage t marriages took place because of political reasons. Um, but a lot of times, it was just because the men were so attracted to these women, they basically... They, you know, they couldn't resist in a sense. Their, their hearts weren't on the Lord either. When your leadership is bad like that, um, then the whole, you know, the whole nation starts to rot. 
And we see it happening today in our nation. Um, and you know as well as I do, a lot of it has to do with the, the, the wickedness in the White House today. Um, the ungodly stuff that's going on there. And not just ungodly, wicked there are abominations that are going on and believe me god sees it believe me he has a cup a cup of wrath and it is filling up quickly they will not get away with it this nation will not get away with it judgment has to come Ooh, that's scary isn't it so some of these gods that uh, he got all involved with one of them was Ashtoreth. She was the goddess of the Sidonians. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So several of these um, gods that they worshipped. There were a few. One was uh, Molech. I'll mention him. He was an Amorite god. He was the god that they would... Um, build a fire underneath his arms and light this fire till his arms were red hot and then they would take their children and lay them in his arms and they would instantly be incinerated they would be burned alive um, is that the ice cream truck Let's all run out and get some ice cream. No. We'll be right back. Ice cream break. <laughs> oh, boy. So anyway, you know, um, I'm not a real expert on baby murder. I know it's murder. And I've been told that... Um, Sometimes they inject a solution in there that pretty much burns the child to death. And I thought of this when I was told that, about that procedure that they do. I was also told that after they do that, as they're pulling the child out, that sometimes it comes out in pieces. Um, you know, this nation was upside down when the Supreme Court ruled on what it ruled on. And everybody is up in arms, screaming and yelling. That's the reason why we did so terrible in the elections, because of that one, well, there's two issues. The LBGTQWXYZ community and abortion. Those are the two issues that our country cares about the most, that the majority of our country care about them. They don't care about the economy. They don't care about freedom. They don't care about democracy. They only care about these two things. And if you don't line up with them in these two things, then you're an evil person. Now, we're beginning to learn, you know, years and years ago, I read that passage where it says, in the last days, they will call good evil and they will call evil good. When I read that 20 years ago, I thought, yeah, they do that. But today, unbelievable how intense they do that. Literally. To switch it totally around and say that we're, the people that don't line up are bad people, and they're good people. And one of the biggest things that we have today in our culture is changing words. It's a real big thing these days. We change words to take the ugliness out of what the word is talking about. We call it health care instead of child murder. They don't even hardly use the word abortion anymore. It's all about women's rights to health care. So, you know, these people, they did some horrible things right here. I cannot imagine taking a child and doing that. And then there's uh, another one, an idol called uh, Shemosh. And Shemosh was kind of like an escort or a consort of Ashtoreth. 
And Ashtoreth was an interesting god. Um, she was the god of uh, lust, if you will. And uh, then there's uh, Baal, or Baal, however you want to pronounce it. it. should be Baal. Baal came about because of um, Jezebel. Jezebel is the one that introduced it that, um, and that cult lasted about 30 years and was pretty much exterminated in the north by um, Elijah. Um, and uh, Jehu uh, and Elisha, um, and it never really made a full comeback after that. But there were another group of false gods that they could grab a hold of to replace him with. Um, Baal is an interesting word because if you look it up in the, your Strong's, you're going to find about 40 different names for this God. You have Baal of the harvest. You have Baal of the rain. Each item they believe that this God controlled. And uh, even to this day, that type of worship is still going on. So Solomon was, uh, you know, we saw the kingdom here 120 years or so. I got Saul, ran it for 40 years, and uh, the nation was intact. David ran it for 40 years, and the nation was intact. Solomon ran it for 40 years, and when he died, the nation was still intact. And his son takes the throne, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam is the one who began the downhill slide, as we're going to read. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. His father started it, but he continued it uh, in a bad, bad way. So let's see, where were we? Verse 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Milcom, the abomination of the Amorite, Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. And then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, another idol, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, another high place, the abomination of the people of Ammon. He did likewise for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So when you read that word high places, that's a special appointed place that was set aside for worship. Now a lot of these false religions were very um, earthy in nature. They were about herbs and they were about things like that. The, the mother earth and you know all that uh, everything is alive and everything has a spirit and all that kind of stuff. Um, basically a lot of it was nature worship. Today we have that too. But a lot of the other worship was violent and totally gross. Um, so he wanted to make sure all of his foreign wives had what they needed. So he got incense for them all. And they would sacrifice to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you've done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. That's a prophecy right there. Right from the mouth of of the Lord himself. However, he said, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. 
Now we know that the northern kingdom became known as the ten tribes of Israel. And then Judah was the southern kingdom. And that is where Jerusalem um, was located. So now some time goes by. Um, God has given him this prophecy. And in verse 14, we don't know how much time has passed. But it says that the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. Hadad, the Edomite. He was a descendant of Edom. So now we're going to get into some of these people's names, which are pretty darn curious when you start looking at what some of them mean. Um, You might remember that um, Edom was Esau's children. Esau, Harry. Um, Esau traded his birthright to his brother for a bowl of red porridge. And so his grandson, or great-grandson here, um, Hadad, um, his name means mighty. Hadad. Edom, his name means red. (laughs) After Esau. So, Lord raises up this adversary, Hadad the Edomite. He comes from Esau's line. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain, after he had killed every male in Edom. Because for six months Joab remained there with all of Israel, until he had cut down every male in Edom. And Hadad fled to go to Egypt he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a little child. And then they arose from Midian and they came to Paran. And they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, a portion food for him, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh so that he gave him his wife, the sister of his own wife. And then the sister of Taphanes, which was the Pharaoh's wife, Queen Taphanes, bore jin his son, whom Taphanes weaned at Pharaoh's house. And jin was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David is resting with his fathers, and the Joab, the commander, is dead. Then Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart that I may go to my own country. And then Pharaoh said to him, But what have you lacked with me that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? And he said, Nothing, but do let me go anyway. He has a plan. And God raised up another adversary against Solomon, Rezon the son of Eliada, who had fled from his lord, Hadadezer, the king of Zobah. And so he gathered men to him, and he became a captain over a band of raiders. When David killed those of Zobah, and they went to Damascus and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the trouble that Hadad caused. And he hated Israel, and he reigned over Syria. Same thing going on still. And then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built Milo, and repaired the damage to the city of David his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the office over all the labor in the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, a Shilonite, met him on the way. 
And he had clothed himself in a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. So Jeroboam's all decked out in his brand new outfit. And, well, actually, I'm not sure if it was Ahijah or Jeroboam. One of them's wearing a new, a new outfit. And then it says, Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him, and he tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me, and they have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Shemash, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes, and keep my statutes and my judgment, as did his father David. Hmm. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose again because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. And to this his son, and to his son, I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you will reign over all your heart desires, and you will be king over Israel. And it shall be that if you heed all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight and keep my statutes and commandments as my servant David did, then I'll be with you and I will build for you an enduring house like I built for David. And I will give Israel to you. What a great promise. What a great opportunity for this guy. You know, he was, he was a servant. He was a hard worker, but he was a servant. And we're starting to see some of that prophetic words come to pass here that the Lord spoke to Solomon earlier. Verse 39, And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, to Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom are written in the book of the Acts of Solomon. And the period that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel was forty years. And then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam... His son reigned in his place. Rehoboam means free liberator of the people, if you will. Jeroboam, our other friend that we met, his name means enlarge, to make something bigger. Of course, we see that happening. Um, a lot of these people's names, actually you get to see their lives follow what their names mean many, many times. Uh, it's always interesting to do those little word studies if you enjoy doing stuff like that. What time we have? Hmm. So chapter 12, verse 1, Rehoboam went to Shechem. Now Shechem was a very special place. Shechem was the place where God first appeared to Abraham. And made all those promises and Abraham built an altar there to him. It could very well be that that's why Rehoboam went there. It was a, a very historic site. It was a place that uh, was well known. And he's going there for his uh, coronation, if you will. Because all of Israel went to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was still in Egypt. For he fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt. 
that they sent and they called him. And then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. We won't separate from you. Just show some mercy to us. So he said to them, Depart for three days and then come back. And all the people departed. So King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. If you show them some kindness and some mercy, they will be your allies forever. Verse 8, But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and he consulted with the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. He said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to these people who, you, who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, you make our yoke light. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. In other words, if you think you had it hard now with him, you're going to have it much harder with me. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Um, one of the other... Um, some of the other translations use the word scorpions right here, where the word scourge is. Um, scourges is probably a better translation. The difference between a whip and a scourge would be a multi-strapped whip that had pieces of bone and metal, much like what Jesus was whipped with before he was crucified. So we're not just going to use whips on your people, we're going to remove chunks from them. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king directed, saying, Come back to me on the third day. So the king answered the people roughly. He rejected the advice which the elders gave him, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. And so the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord. Take note of that, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam son of Nebat. So, what is that all about? This is a very important fact, very important situation we see happening here. You might remember that this prophet is the one that caught up um, to Jeroboam and tore the outfit into 12 pieces and gave Jeroboam 10. He prophesied and he said, these 10 peoples will be yours. Now, the smart thing for Rehoboam to have done here would be welcome the people. Make them part of the family. But no... His heart was hardened towards these people. And it almost would appear here that God knew that this guy was going to have a hard heart towards these people. And because of his hard heart towards these people, his declaration with his own mouth would set in motion the dividing of the kingdom. So when Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king and said, What share do we have in David? 
We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. In other words, we're out of here. You're going to do this to us? We're, we're the children of Israel too. We were part of David's kingdom too. So Israel departed to their tents. They all went home. And they're very unhappy. But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. So there's still some of those people still in Judah. And then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. But all of Israel stoned him with stones and he died. He sent this guy to go collect taxes from the ten tribes and they executed him. They stoned him. So therefore, Rehoboam mounts his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when all of Israel had heard that Jeroboam came back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation, and they made him the king over Israel. There was none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So we're going to have a civil war, a huge one. They're going to try to take back the northern kingdom. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, and say, Thus saith the Lord, You shall not go up and fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the word of the Lord. They turned back according to the word of the Lord. So, they were just about ready for war. Um, God spoke through the prophet and said, don't go fight with your own brothers because what's going on right now is part of my plan. It probably didn't look like it at the time. So what do we draw quickly from that? Are there things that happen in our lives that could be kind of upsetting or maybe appear to be off the map? Or why in the world would the, you know, God let this happen, right? And then we find out down the path that it was all part of a plan that God had. It happens in all of our lives, I think. So Jeroboam went and built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. He also went out and built Penuel, Penuel, however you want to pronounce that name. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> Where are we? Thank you. So Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifice at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice. He made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, It's way too far for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here, here's your gods, Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he set one up in Bethel, and he put the other one in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before one, before the one, as far as Dan. So he puts these two calves. Does this sound familiar? These golden calves? Kind of something like what Aaron did with the people. And look here, he makes shrines on the high places. He made priests from every class of people. Literally translated, he made priests of the lowlifes, the scoundrels. So 
So he ordains a feast on the phone. Oh, wait a minute. He made shrines and priests who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah. He's trying to build this cult in the north to look like what's going on in Judah or what God had laid out for them, um, but it's counterfeit. He's just trying to keep possession of the people. So he ordains this feast, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. And so he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of high places, which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel, on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained the feast for the children of Israel, and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So, a lot of information there. Um, just for the sake of stuff that's interesting, um, they've unearthed, again, excavated, I guess is the word, um, the city of Dan. Um, and they found in the city of Dan a... Well, I would say it's not cement, but it kind of like a cement slab. And they believe that this cement slab is where he put this golden calf. That they would all go and worship it there. It was obviously a place of worship, and it has this slab there that they believe is where this stuff took place. So it's there even, even to this day. So we can see uh, the kingdom falling apart very quickly. And uh, it's really sad when families, <laughs> when families have to take sides against each other. But unfortunately, that's, that's what's going on here. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to go through these two chapters tonight. I never thought we would make it. <laughs> uh, but thank you, God, for these stories. And, Lord, there's so much really in here that we can apply to our lives. But I think the biggest thing we walk away from here, God, is faithfulness. To be faithful to you, Lord, no matter what. No matter what kind of sparkling things come down our path, Lord, that, that we would see through that. Lord, that we would keep our hearts fixed upon you. Lord, your word says, keep my mind stayed upon you so I might not sin against you, O Lord. Lord, put your words in our mouth. Put your love in our hearts, God. Empower us by your Holy Spirit. Continue to lead us and direct us, God, for your purposes and for your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.